Hi, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I do these daily updates on the war in Ukraine, and I do these every day, including Christmas. So thank you for being here, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares enough about Ukraine to watch this. Again, it's day 306. It's the day after Christmas, and uh, I was Googling, will the war in Ukraine end soon? No, it will not end soon. And the reason is that Ukraine's just not that into you, Russia. I mean, really, uh, there's a theme here today that... Putin seems to think he's going to unite or reunite the Russian speaking, Russian orbit kind of world. The Russian world is what they call it, Rus Mur or something along those lines. Uh, and it's it's just, it's a pipe dream. Let me show you a number of articles that will kind of paint this picture for you and stick around to the end because I have a great joke that you want to hear. Okay. Uh, so the first thing is this is an Al Jazeera. Putin is ready for talks as the Russian, as Russian missiles rain down on Ukraine. It's probably not the best way to win friends and influence people to uh, rain missiles down on them, but okay. Russian President Vladimir Putin has claimed that Russia, uh, Moscow is ready for talks to end the 10-month war in Ukraine. He slammed Western countries for trying to, quote, tear apart historical Russia. It's not Western countries tearing apart historical Russia. It's Russia tearing apart historical Russia. Like it's self induced, and he can't seem to see that. In the interview, which aired on Moscow's Russia One television, Putin said, We are ready to negotiate with everyone involved about an accept about acceptable solutions, but that's up to them. We're not the ones refusing to negotiate. They are. Well, you're refusing to have reasonable terms like the idea that maybe you shouldn't be able to grab and snatch other people's lands and call it your own. Okay, let me show you this same article in RT. Russia has no choice but to defend its interests and people. So they're locked into this mentality. They have no choice. They can't see anything but that. I'm convinced that we're moving the right direction. We're protecting our national interests, the interests of our citizens, our people. We simply have no other choice but to protect our citizens. Okay. You do have a choice. You're a bully beating on your neighbor that, that like, if you're trying to bring them back into the fold, this isn't the way you're trying to dominate, not woo. And there's a, it's totally different. Okay. Uh, the same uh, line here, the policy of our geopolitical opponents lies at the core of all this aimed at pulling Russia, historical Russia apart. Again, it's you can't blame the West. At a certain point, you just got to move on with life. Like they're not that into you. Okay. Now, what's really interesting here was uh, yesterday was Christmas, at least Christmas as we know it in the West, right? December 25th. The R R Russian Orthodox Church celebrates it on a different day. They celebrate it on uh, January 7th. And, and there is something interesting here that uh, the 12 days of Christmas goes from about uh, December 25th to about the 6th of, this, of January. And then that's when the Russians celebrate it. By the way, I'm showing you my old channel. Um, I talked about this yesterday. And if you haven't gone back to yesterday to watch that, please do. Um, I, I went back and I was explaining, like, for example, a lot of us YouTubers that are talking about what's going on in Ukraine, we were doing something else first, and then we shifted gears. Like I was talking about everything related to leadership issue kind of stuff. That's kind of a passion in life of mine. And then the war hit, and it just, just became so important and overwhelmingly important that I had to shift gears, and I had to actually start a different channel because it had it was so not just, just about leadership and so much more about Ukraine. At any rate, uh, if you look in the community tab, you can find links to this, to these Christmassy kind of versions of this leadership talk that I had on my leadership channel. Okay, so at any rate, let's go back to where we were. Ukrainians move up their traditional Christmas celebration to break with Russia, some Orthodox Ukrainians have decided to observe Christmas on December 25th, like many Christians around the world. Uh, the choice of dates has clear political and religious overtones in a nas nation with rival Orthodox churches and where slight revisions to rituals can carry potent meaning and culture war that runs parallel to the shooting war. For some people, changing dates represents a separation from Russia, its culture, and its religion. So this is intentional and it's part of the defiance because Ukraine's just not that into you. People in a village on the outskirts of Kiev voted recently to move up their Christmas observance. What began on February 24th, the full-scale invasion, is an awakening and an understanding that we 
can no longer be part of the Russian world, says Olina, whatever, just some 33-year-old resident that's being interviewed. But that's the sentiment in Ukraine right now. Okay, so let me look at another article here. Um, by the way, I read I read a lot. It, just, it struck me. I read 358 articles this year from The, the Guardian alone, which I, surprised me. Um, the revenge of history in Ukraine. Year of war has shaken up the world order. Ukraine writer Os- Osanka Zabukso recalls a quote attributed to Otto von Bismarck. Wars are not won by generals, but by school teachers and parish priests. Now think about that. I spend my time talking about what's going on politically and culturally and economically and informationally because this is also where the war is going on. Yes, it's happening on the ground. And I look at a deep state map and I and I read the ISW and I look at that. But there's so much more to the war than just, just what's going on on the ground. It's all these other things. It's a country taught. Uh, it's a country's taught collective memory. It's shared sense of its own history that are the decisive interest uh, instruments for mobilization. Yeah, that's there's something very right about this. George Kazanov, the U- Ukrainian historian, said Russian forces have been smashing their way through Ukraine, spurred in large part by historical fiction. Now think about that. Their their fiction. Their, the cause of the war is that they believe that Ukraine and Russia are one. Ukraine is not Russia. And until Russia recognizes that, it's they're going to keep coming. And Ukraine's not going to stop fighting because they do recognize that. Ukrainians too harbor, a, but this history also propels the fierce Ukrainian resistance. Ukrainians too harbor a political understanding of the past that motivates them to fight. In many ways, this war is the collision of two incompatible historical narratives. Okay, that's why it's not going to be over anytime soon. Ukraine is not Russia. Putin is sometimes described not as the commander in chief, but as Russia's historian in chief. And he's a terrible historian, a revisionist historian on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians published in July 2021. And if you haven't seen this document, you ought to see that document just to get a a sense of how Putin is thinking. It's it's kind of weird. Um, In this document, Putin argued that Ukraine was historically indistinguishable from Russia, citing Oleg, the prophet's 10th century dictum, let Kiev be the mother of all Russian cities. And historically, years ago, there was much more of a merging of stuff, but it's not the same as one country dominating the other in this same way, which is the way that Putin wants to do it. Um, This person, I can't pronounce the name, director of the Ukrainian Institute in London, argues that Ukraine's historical experience of statelessness and struggle, repressive external rule and hard-won independence has shaped Ukraine into the nation we see today, as opposed opposed to imperialism, united in the face of the enemy, determined to protect its freedom. I thought, wow, that's there's something really profound there. But the real profundity came in this last paragraph. It was not until the advent of Vladimir Zelensky and the independence generation. So there's a generational shift that's willing to stand and fight. Okay, Those who grew up after Ukraine left the Soviet Union, that Ukraine addressed the issues of the past, identity and language in a more inclusive way, such as uh, as Olag Onak sets out in her book, The Zelensky Effect. Zelensky, a former comedian and actor elected in 2019, understood the importance of history. Now, indeed, the opening scenes of Servant of the People, the TV show that made his name, Zelensky plays a history teacher trying to convince his pupils of the importance of the historian in 1903 who first tried to show how Ukrainian history was not merely part of an overarching Russian story that they're their own people. Now, by the way, if you look on Netflix, you can see Servant of the People. It's in subtitles. They're actually, actually, I believe it's spoken in Russian and it, there's uh, English subtitles. I'm about halfway through the second season. There's three seasons of it right now. Uh, and it's actually really interesting to watch simultaneously while everything is going on. Um, I've heard a lot of people say things on on my channel. They would make like the Russian trolls would argue like, well, just give them these territories and be done with it or whatever. I would argue the opposite. I would argue as a counter proposal, Russia should give up these territories here. This is Crimea and here is the uh, Sea of Azov. Uh, I, Russia should give up these oblasts right here. And that should be part of Ukraine's position of negotiation. Because why is it that Ukraine has to give up any territories at all? Russia is the invader. Russia is the is the uh, culprit here. I think that as part of the negotiations for peace, they should have to give up this swath of land right here. Uh, what do you think? I'm curious. Okay, let's keep going. 
Um, now, this was another, the Marshall Plan, how will Ukraine be rebuilt? And that's what kind of prompted this, this thought. And so I put that uh, that map there. For Ukraine, the answer is clear. Russia must ultimately pay for justice to be served. There's no alternative to Russia paying. Now, there's, I'm sure some people will think, well, the West will pay, the US, Europe, whatever. We, we're already paying a lot and we want to help you. But really, if justice is to be served, it should come from Russia oil. They're a big gas station masquerading as a nation, as John McCain famously said. There's no alternative to Russian paying. If Russia does not want to honor its obligation to pay the reparations for the damaging and suffering it has caused, we together with the civilized world need to find a way to Russia to, for Russia to pay. And here's my suggestion. This becomes Ukraine, this area right here. Yeah. Let's see what, what how that goes. I bet you they won't like that proposal. Okay, let's go on to the next article. Here's, by the way, how much the U.S. has paid as opposed to the rest of the world. And I'm not, this is um, uh, as of November 20th. So this was $18.5 billion as opposed to two, two, a little less than two. And that's that's a lot for Poland, but I, I get it. Canada's at about one and then it go, drops down. Now, percentage wise for their population, Estonia and just below this are Lithuania and um, Latvia are, you know, pound for pound given a lot. And the U.S. just added another forty-five billion to that. So we've been doing our share. We're pulling our weight. Come on, Europe. Let's get let's get crackalacking with it because they need their support. If again, I was talking with my daughter about this this morning. The reason that this is important is so that it doesn't get worse. It's not that I like giving money out. I mean, there are other priorities that we could spend on, but we don't want to let this go any further. This fester and and become something more than it has already become. Okay. Um, oh, upwards in this in this article, there was some really interesting stuff. Russia's Ukraine war based on a disastrous mis miscalculation. This was in DW, and I don't usually cite DW, but this was really, really good. There's only three years of Putin's reign all the way from the end of 1999 to today in which Russia was not engaged in one war or another. That's fascinating. And yet there has been always these limited ones. Putin has always essentially picked targets that he thought he could win easily. Wow, that's what bullies do. That's exactly what bullies do. Uh, until we saw that televised meeting on the Security Council on the week of the invasion, it was only a 30 to 40% chance that it was going to happen, the, the war. And in fact, I remember sitting in a cafeteria with my colleagues at school talking about like, nah, I don't think it's Putin saber rattling. It, it can't, he won't invade. That's, there's no way he's going to do that. I was saying that. I was wrong. Um, precisely because it didn't seem to make sense. Right up to that point, in many ways, Putin was winning. Like, what was he getting from doing that, putting it on the border? He was actually achieving material gains without having to fire a shot. He assembled this huge force on Ukraine's border, and the presence of that force without crossing the borders was causing serious harm to the Ukrainian economy. And it was also leading to a stream of important leaders from the West traveling to Moscow, putting Putin in the position that he likes to be as they were petitioning him not to start a war. There was also pressure on Kiev to make concessions. He was winning right up to the border. Putin had convinced himself that Ukraine was not a real country, that the Ukrainians would not meaningfully resist, that the so-called drug addict, Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, would either flee or be captured. Like they had this really dim view of Zelensky. And uh, I don't think their view was justified, but it certainly was not justified after the war began. This culture of now, there's a reason why they could have this terrible view, because the the um, the planning was such that and and the, the level of truth, you can't tell the truth to a dictator. And I've talked about this before, but when I would hate to be a dictator. If you were a dictator, you can't get truth. People are always kissing your butt. They're, they're all yes men saying what you want to hear. And so there's a culture of insulating the president from inconvenient truths that have emerged. And that's why one of the reasons why, like, so Putin already wants to do this, but it's clear that he wants to do this. And so now everybody's feeding him things that are showing, yes, you should do this. You should do this. Where it matters is where you have a key decision that he will make, he will initiate, he will push, and then he can drag the whole country into this kind of disaster because he's not really seeing reality. Like he thought this was going to go a whole different way. And so that's what's going on there. Okay, let me move on to another article. Um, <laughs> we need support, air support. 
Ukraine, you're doing great, says the United Nations. Well, that's what we're talking about when we're looking at this. Like, come on, step up and and give what they need to have in order to bring this to a conclusion. Please give. Okay, next. Um, so here in Al Jazeera, uh, key events of the day, Sunday was Christmas and uh, Russian forces bombarded dozens of towns in Ukraine on Christmas Day. Russian, uh, they bombed 25 towns in this particular region and another 20 towns over here. And okay, so it's it's ongoing. They're, they're not pausing for anything. Um, but again, Ukraine's just not that into you. Now, along those lines, we see this in the Guardian, Ukraine war, uh, three killed by a drone attack on an air base. So they're striking back. Uh, three Russian military personnel were killed early on Monday when a Ukraine drone attacked the base in Russia's Saratov region. Now, where Saratov region? This is what's really interesting about it. Uh, the Guardian has not verified whether the drone was shot down uh, or not, as the Russians are claiming. Uh, the air base near the city of Saratov is about 730 kilometers or 450 miles southeast of Moscow. So it's deep into their territory, 600 kilometers or 370 miles from the Ukrainian border. Now, that's interesting because because of where it is, it's just like the Angles incident about a month ago. Um, now, here's the RT article on the same thing. Three killed in a Ukrainian drone attack. The UAV traveling at low altitude was shot down by the base's air defense, but three servicemen suffered fatal wounds from the falling debris, the ministry said. That sounds a little fishy to me, but I can't prove otherwise. Um, so I would generally take the newspaper report at its word, except that it's RT and they lie and they lie about lying and they, they lie about lying about lying. So uh, I wouldn't believe it at all. Okay. Um, if you've gotten some value out of what we've talked about here, please like, share, subscribe, comment, turn on the notifications, whatever. Um, I, I will be here tomorrow. I was here on Christmas Day. I will be back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I feel feel like it's the least I can do. I mean, if they can actually fight the war on the ground in Ukraine, the least I can do is provide the information to help people understand what's going on. By the way, I want to say a big thank you to those of you, the five of you who have um, bought me a cup of coffee or, or more. Um, and I really deeply appreciate it because it kind of validates. You don't know this, but I was actually one video away from stopping at one point and then somebody's in encouragement. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened, maybe another day, but a certain bit of encouragement kept me going. Um, and uh, I really deeply appreciate your vote of confidence. Uh, here's what I promised you, the joke. So Zelensky is uh, phoning uh, Putin and says, hey, you want to hear a joke? Go ahead. Kiev. I don't get it. That's right. You don't. Okay. On that note, thank you for your time. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.